Well, welcome to this talk on the nervous system. Now, the nervous system is one of the fundamental systems of the body that we need to understand if we're going to have any idea about anatomy, physiology, and the pathophysiology, how the body can go wrong, and what we're going to do about that. So it's one of the fundamental things where we need to get a grasp of the basic information. And this is for people that are serious about this, who want to understand the basics of the nervous system that will allow them to go on to understand the nervous system in more detail. Now we're all multi-celled animals possess nervous tissue but no plants possess nervous tissue so this is something which is unique to animals. So even the simplest multicellular animal will have some degree of nervous coordination going on facilitated by a nervous system of some sort and these become increasingly complicated with increasingly complex animals now there's some nervous systems such as in whales and very large animals that are bigger than human nervous systems but none which are more complicated the human nervous system is the most complicated structure that we know of for example in your brain alone there's a hundred thousand million nerve cells and each of these nerve cells has between 1,000 and up to 10,000 synaptic interconnections making your brain the most complicated known structure in the universe. So the nervous system is this system of internal communication and it's rapid. The endocrine system is a system of internal communication as well but it tends to be a bit on the slow side. So the nervous system is rapid to allow transportation and passage of messages around the body. So it includes perception, we can perceive our environment, we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can touch, we can taste. Then we can process that information and then we can initiate some sort of appropriate response that allows us to interact in a purposeful way with our environment. So we're perceiving things, we're processing information and then we're behaving and facilitating movements and reactions to that information and to the processing that's going on inside our nervous system. And this is what makes the nervous such system such an interesting topic for study. Now the whole nervous system can be anatomically divided into the central nervous system, the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. Now the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So the brain and the spinal cord are the CNS. The peripheral nervous system is any other nervous tissue found in the body which is not part of the brain or the spinal cord. So the cranial nerves, for example, coming from the brain would be part of the peripheral nervous system. Or the nerve roots leaving the spinal cord going into the limbs would be part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, if we think about the histology of the nervous system, this means the type of cells it's made up of and the way that the tissues are arranged. Then the nervous system is made up of nerve cells and nerve cells are excitable cells. The nerve cells are the cells which are electrically active. And these nerve cells are referred to as the neurons. Now, in the UK, we spell neuron with an E. In the States, you leave off the E, but it's the same thing. These are the excitable cells that actually generate electrical activity in order to communicate with each other and to communicate around the body. So the neuron are the nerve cells. But the nervous system is not just composed of nerve cells. As well as the neurons in nervous tissue, there's also a range of supportive cells. And these supportive cells carry out different functions. They physically protect, they nourish, they regulate the activity of neurons. And these other cells in the central nervous system, which are supporting cells, are called glial cells or the neuroglia, the glial cells. And the main difference between the two is that the neurons are electrically active cells, they're excitable cells, whereas the glial cells are not. But the glial cells are supporting the function 
of the neurons. So the neurons are cells like any other cells, but of course they're specialized. They are differentiated to give them a specific form that is able to provide a, a particular function. So like any other cells, the neurons are surrounded by a membrane. They contain cytoplasm and these active units in the cell called the organelles. And they also have a nucleus which is going to contain the genetic material. And there are different types of neurons which are going to perform different functions. So motor neurons, sensory neurons and relay neurons are often the ones we learn about first. Now here we see a diagram of a motor neuron. Now motor means to do with movement. So these are neurons which initiate and regulate and control movement of the body. So anytime you see motor, that means to do with movement. So a motor disorder would be a disorder of the ability to move the body. And we see that the motor neurons have a, a cell body with a dark stained nucleus in the middle. Now, one of the key things to grasp here is the direction that the impulses are traveling. So the arrows here indicate the direction of travel. So we see that electrical information, or information I should say in the form of electrical impulses, or neuronal or nerve impulses is traveling towards the cell body in the dendrites. So a dendrite is any nerve fiber carrying information towards a cell body, in this case a motor neuron. So information from other neurons is going into the cell body of the motor neuron and these are dendrites. And then electrical activity or electrical currents are carried. We'll actually see this later on. There's actually waves of electrical activity passing down these neurons that are nerve, nerve impulses. But the nerve impulse that's generated in a cell body is going to leave the cell body via an axon. So an axon is any nerve fiber carrying information away from a cell body. And that, that's the defining difference. Dendrites carry information towards the cell body. Axons carry information away from the cell body. Now, very often there's a myelin sheath associated with neurons. And these myelin sheaths are prefer, composed of Schwann cells. And these are individual cells that wrap around the nerve fibers. And these are an example of the glial cells we talked about, the supporting cells. Now, the Schwann cells are actually specific to the peripheral nervous system. So the Schwann cells comprise the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, there's actually a different type of cell performs that function called the oligodendrocyte or the oligodendra glial cells. And we also see that there are small gaps in between these individual Schwann cells that are composing the myelin sheath and these are called the neurofibril nodes, what used to be called the nodes of Rambia. And we'll see later on that these greatly increase the speed of neuronal transmission. And then we see that the motor neuron ends in synaptic end plates. Now a synapse is a gap. So nerve cells are not in physical contact with each other. There's always a gap between them. And this gap is crossed by chemical transmitters. So at some points in neuronal activity, the nerve impulse is electrical when it's in the nerve fiber. But in other phases of the activity, when it's crossing the synapses, it's chemical in nature. So these synaptic end bulbs will produce a chemical which produces or which communicates with another neuron. Or sometimes with motor neurons, these synaptic end bulbs communicate with the muscle to allow contraction and depolarization of a muscle. Now, motor neurons are carrying information from the central nervous system out towards the peripheral nervous system because it's the peripheral nerves that communicate with the muscles to facilitate movement. So motor neurons are always carrying information out from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. 
In other words, the information is exiting the central nervous system into the peripheral nervous system. And for this reason, we call motor neurons efferent neurons. So efferent means to go from the central nervous system into the peripheral nervous system, information going out. It is efferent. And the motor neurons are going to be located in efferent pathways. Bundles of motor nerve fibers together in larger structures called nerves carrying information from the central nervous system out towards the peripheral nervous system in these efferent pathways. So in this presentation I'm going to include quite a few of these screens full of written information which you can obviously freeze frame and uh, take your time with. Now here we're looking at a sensory neuron and we're looking at a sensory neuron in the peripheral nervous system. And what these do is they detect information about the environment and transfer that into the central nervous system. So these sensory neurons are taking information into the central nervous system. They go, information is going from the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system. And for this reason, we describe these as afferent neurons. They are carrying the information in. Remember, the motor neurons were efferent. The sensory neurons are afferent. And bundles of sensory neurons will be together in larger structures called nerves. And these are forming afferent pathways, taking information into the central nervous system. Now, we noted that in motor neurons, a new nerve impulse would be generated in the motor neuron cell body. But it's different in peripheral neurons. A new nerve impulse is generated by a peripheral sensory receptor, as we see diagrammatically represented in this picture. Now, if this is in the eye, it could be detecting light. If it's in the fingers, it could be detecting touch or pain or pressure. If it's in the tongue, it would be detecting taste. If it was in the nose, it would be detecting smell. If it were in the ears, it would be detecting auditory stimuli. It would be detecting sound. So the principle is the same. So a peripheral sensory receptor, let's take the example of touch. Let's imagine this is a peripheral sensory receptor in your fingertips and it's detecting touch. Now, when you touch something, these touch receptors are going to generate a brand new nerve impulse. So the nerve impulse, in a sense, well, it didn't exist before. It's generated by the tactility, in this case, by the touching of an object. That's going to generate a new nerve impulse. And that new nerve impulse will travel from the peripheral sensory receptor where it's generated, and it goes up this dendrite. And remember, a dendrite is any nerve fiber carrying an electrical stimulus or a nerve impulse to the cell body. And the cell body in these sensory neurons, which are located in the peripheral nervous system, the cell bodies are close to the spinal cord. So if this was in your fingertips, this dendrite would be traveling up your arm towards your spinal cord. So again, the dendrite carries the information to the cell body, then from the cell body, the information, the electrical nerve impulse, is going to go from the cell body out along the axon. And again, we see the arrow is going from the cell body away along the axon. So the axon is any nerve fiber carrying a nerve impulse away from the cell body. So it's the same as in the motor neuron, really. The dendrites are carrying the information towards the cell body. The axon is carrying it away from the cell body. And in the case of this peripheral sensory neuron, that information is going to be carried into the spinal cord if it's coming from your arm. And then from your spinal cord, another sensory neuron is going to take it up towards the brain, ascending up the spinal cord. It's going to be an ascending afferent pathway. And then these synaptic end bulbs again are going to produce chemical transmitters.
communicating with other sensory fibers till eventually the information is going to get to the relevant part of the brain and the relevant part of the brain when it gets this electrical nervous information is going to generate in our brains in our minds the experience of that sensation and in that way the experience that we are experiencing in our brain in our minds if you like is a product of what is in the environment and this is how we're able to get information from the environment that information is then going to be processed in the brain and appropriate motor activity is going to take place as motor impulses are generated which are going to travel to the peripheral nervous system via the efferent nerve fibers so remember the sensory neurons are afferent taking the information in and again we see that they have these schwann cells the neurofibral nodes which greatly increase the rate of neuronal transmission as indeed was the case with the motor neurons Now the spinal cord runs from the base of the brain round to down to round about the second lumbar vertebrae. And what we're looking at in this diagram is, is just a, a slice of spinal cord at a particular level. It's called a transverse section of spinal cord. And what this does is it shows the motor and the sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system and their relationship to the spinal cord. Now this is looking from as if it's looking from on top of someone, it's looking from a, a superior view. And we notice that the top of the diagram is the back of the person and the bottom of the diagram is the front of the person. So I've put the back and the front in red letters there. So the back is at the top of the picture. Because what happens is the sensory impulses always go into the back of the spinal cord. It's called the uh, dorsal nerve root. It's the, the dorsal surface or, or the posterior nerve root. So if you run your finger down someone's back, you're running the, your finger down their uh, dorsal surface. If you run your finger down the front, you're running it down their uh, ventral surface in this terminology. So we see at the uh, top left of the diagram, there's a peripheral sensory receptor, and that's going to generate a new nerve impulse in response to some environmental stimulus. That the impulse is then going to travel up the dendrite, and for simplicity, I've left the myelin sheath off here, but it's going to go up the dendrite, and we can see it's going to approach the spinal cord in a, in a spinal nerve from a particular area of the body. So that information is going to go in the dendrite into the spinal nerve, but then when it gets very near the spinal cord, the spinal nerve divides into the sensory pathway at the back and the motor pathway at the front. So we've got peripheral sensory receptor, information going up the dendrite towards the cell body of the sensory neuron and you can see the cell body of the sensory neuron labeled there into the posterior nerve root or the dorsal nerve root going in the back way and that's taking that information into the spinal cord into the back of the spinal cord now from there it can go up the spinal cord towards the brain where it can be recognized as sensation so that's the relationship of the sensory neuron with the spinal cord so that's kind of putting together the sensory neuron diagram and this new spinal cord diagram. Now the motor neuron, if we're thinking about the, uh, the peripheral motor neuron here, for example, a motor neuron that might run from your spinal cord through your arm so you can move your fingers, then the cell body of that motor neuron there is in the front part of the spinal cord. Now that will be activated by a descending neuron usually from higher up from the brain for example 
that will activate that motor neuron cell body, generate the new nerve impulse, or propagate a nerve impulse which has come down from the brain, and that will leave into the peripheral nervous system. Remember, the spinal cord is the central nervous system. So that will leave into the peripheral nervous system via the anterior nerve root, the front nerve root, also sometimes called the ventral nerve root. That is leaving out the front. And again, after a short distance, that will go into a common spinal nerve. And then that will subdivide into smaller peripheral nerves and in the case of a motor neuron, ultimately that is going to end up synapsing with a muscle. So you can see a skeletal muscle there. And the electrical nerve impulse coming along the axon of the motor neuron will go through those synaptic end bulbs, release chemical transmitters that will cause the muscle to contract. So there we see the relationship between the peripheral neuron taking the information into the spinal cord and the motor neuron taking the information out from the spinal cord into the periphery. The sensory neuron is afferent, taking it in. The motor neuron is efferent, taking the nerve impulses out. Now the nerve fibres we've been looking at so far are microscopic structures associated with one single neuron. But a nerve is a larger structure, it's a macroscopic structure. And many nerves you can see clearly with the naked eye, they can be quite large. It's said that a spinal nerve is the size of a, a decent worm. So it's going to be a good few millimetres across. Now, a nerve is actually a collection of the microscopic nerve fibres. And of course, the myelin sheath that uh, are associated with those, if they are myelinated fibres, often arranged in bundles within a nerve, within a single nerve, macroscopic nerve, which in itself is surrounded by connective tissue. So there's going to be the 12 pairs of cranial nerves communicating between the body and the brain directly. That's uh, 24 nerves altogether, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And there's going to be um, 62 spinal nerves arranged in 31 pairs. So the brain is communicating with the body between 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. That's the only way that the brain communicates with the body. The spinal nerves, of course, are nerves where the nerve uh, fibres run via the spinal cord. Now, in any one nerve, typically, we're looking at a more macroscopic nerve here, any one nerve there's going to be motor and sensory fibres. And the larger nerves, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves, are going to break up into smaller peripheral nerves. So, for example, going into the hand, you have the ulnar nerve going down the ulna. That's the one you can sometimes bash. We call it your funny bone, and it gives you that nasty electrical type feeling down into your uh, small thing, your little finger and the finger beside it, the um, fourth and fifth digits. But the ulnar nerve itself might contain 20,000 individual microscopic nerve fibres. So it's actually a very complicated structure. And then the median nerve also goes into the hand, supplying largely the thumb and the uh, second and third digits. And uh, it's actually the median nerve that goes through the carpal tunnel. Um, so you might have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, where this becomes constricted, giving rise to neurological features in the hand. So a nerve is this microscopic structure, and it's a way of neatly, tidily, rooting all these microscopic nerve fibres around the body. Well, the myelin sheath surrounds the individual nerve fibres on a microscopic level. And the myelin is a fatty substance. It's lipid-based. It contains cholesterol. It needs some omega-3 fatty acids as well uh, to form. That's why it's important that pregnant women and uh, young children have some omega-3 fatty acids in their diet to correctly form the the myelin sheath. 
which is a large component, of course, of the brain. The myelin also contains protein. There's one called a myelin basic protein. And there's also glycoproteins, combinations of carbohydrates and protein. So the myelin itself it is quite a complicated substance, really. And the, um, the actual precise chemical makeup of the myelin is going to vary in different parts of the nervous system to provide specialist function. Um, so it's quite a subject in its own right, really, myelin. Um, you get myelinated fibres, of course. The, the myelinated fibres are surrounded by myelin. Individual glial cells producing this myelinated sheath. And the function of these is to... Well, one of the functions is that they greatly increase the rate of neuronal transmission. The nerve fibres are able to transmit the nerve impulse much more quickly. There's also some C fibres that um, also transmit nerve impulses, but they do the transmission much slower than the myelinated fibres. Now myelin, as we've said, is fatty. And the reason milk is white is because it contains a fat emulsion. And it's the same in the nervous system. The white matter is white because it contains the myelin. It's the white fatty tissue that you are seeing when you look at white matter. So traditionally in the nervous system, it's been described as composed of two types of matter, white matter and grey matter. If you slice a brain, you can see the layers of white matter and grey matter. So the white matter are the nerve fibres and the grey matter are the nerve cell bodies, as you might see, for example, in the cerebral cortex. Of course, anatomists were looking at dead specimens. In life, the grey matter is a much uh, more pinky colour. Now, the myelin itself is made by glial cells. Remember these supporting cells, the glial cells. They're not neurons, but they support the tissue and they support the neurons which actually compose the nervous system. Now, the cell in the peripheral nervous system that produces the myelin is called Schwann cells. So around a long nerve fibre there will be many individual Schwann cells wrapping around producing the myelin sheath. In the central nervous system, however, the um, myelin is produced by a different type of glial cell called the oligodendrocyte. And uh, people can suffer from demyelinating diseases. For example, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system is mistakenly attacking its own central nervous system myelin, giving rise to lesions in the brain and spinal cord and the subsequent neurological features generated by those lesions. Now as you look along a nerve fibre there's going to be gaps in between the individual cells that make up the myelin sheath. In the peripheral nervous system there's going to be gaps between the individual Schwann cells composing the myelin sheath. And these are called the neurofibral nodes or they used to be called the nodes of Ranvia. And these are responsible for saltatory transmission. So the so-called A and B type peripheral fibres are capable of saltatory transmission because they're myelinated. Although we did mention there's another type of nerve fibre called the C fibres, which are non-myelinated. But the big advantage of the myelinated fibres is they're capable of saltatory transmission, where the nerve impulse, the depolarization, jumps from one neurofibril node to the next, greatly increasing the speed of neuronal transmission, greatly increasing the speed at which the nerve fibre can carry the nerve impulse. So basically we can say that the myelin sheath insulates, protects, nourishes, facilitates saltatory transmission. And it also aids in repair. Because if you damage peripheral nerve fibres, they can actually recover at the rate of about one millimetre a month. So the recovery is very slow. But if someone deinnervates a finger, for example, due to injury, then those nerve fibres can grow back very slowly at the rate of about one and a half, 1.2 centimetres a year. So it's very slow. It's around about a millimetre a month. But, but there is some degree of recovery. And myelination itself is a progressive process. It starts in a fetal life, of course, in the third trimester, the 
last three months of pregnancy, there's fairly significant myelination in the brain and central nervous system. That's why it's so important that pregnant mums are able to get some of the right fatty material in their diet, the omega-3 fatty acids particularly, that people can be short of. And the process of myelination goes on through childhood into late adolescence. And um, I suppose you could say that adolescence almost finishes when the brain is mature around about the age of 18 or 19 years for most people.